and I will try to do my best. Uh, <laughs> so just to run through uh, Eskis bio first, so he took his, uh, uh, originally his uh, master's degree from the University of Copenhagen and uh, also his PhD. Then he did a postdoc at Oxford and went back to the University of Copenhagen afterwards where he's now at, in the museum there, so similar uh, institute as, as, as here. And that's where he's doing his research, running several different uh, big centers there, the Center for Geogenetics in particular, but also he also has another center that is, is leading the, which is uh, by the Lundbeck Foundation in, in Denmark. So um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Eske is by now the world's leader in, uh, in analysis and retrieval of ancient DNA uh, and ancient DNA studies uh, uh, generally. So he um, started off mostly working on Syst on uh, systems of uh, Pleistocene mammals, looking at you know woolly rhino, woolly mammoths, and so on, but also looking at environmental DNA. So he's one of the first ones that did things like getting DNA out of ice cores that drilling down the ice in Greenland, and also using environmental DNA in, in other contexts. Since then, he has uh, recently focused a lot on, on, on human evolution and looked at uh, various uh, getting DNA out of uh, hominins and getting DNA out of. Uh, more recent human samples uh, and many of his recent papers are on that, but he has a very broad uh, research program on many areas of ancient DNA. Um, so uh, he's of course won many different prizes, lots of prizes in Denmark you wouldn't have heard about probably, but also he was elected into the member National Academy of Sciences last year, I think he must be one of the younger members of the National Academy. Uh, elected in as a foreign member. So, in addition, of course, to being a stellar scientist, it's also in Denmark a bit of a, a celebrity. So, <laughs> if, you, if you turn on the TV and you'll see Eske a lot uh, there. So, where every time I go back to Denmark, where I'm also from, I always, you know, talk. My mom says, "Oh, did you hear Eske said this? Eske said that." So, <laughs> so, 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 why can't you do interesting research like Eske? <laughs> Why is all your work so boring? You should be more. And I say, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so we all, um, we all in, in going uh, in Denmark to have Eske there. He's certainly uh, putting color to to Denmark and making life for us much more interesting in many different ways. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have him here. He's a visitor here for the next uh, uh, couple of months uh, as a as a Miller Fellow. And so, if you want to uh, talk with him, uh, he will be here for for a while. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the invitation. So. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll probably jump some slides because I thought actually I had longer time than uh, 15 minutes, but, but don't worry, uh, I'll try to, to do it in that time. So, so one of the things that uh, my group is interested in is um, what we call the late quaternary megaphone extinctions, right? So if we go back you know, 10, 12,000 years in time, we will see an environment in both Europe and Asia and the Americas that was very different from today. And one of the things that made it very different was at this time we had these a large diversity of these big-bodied mammals, uh, woolly mammoth, rhinoceros, uh, uh, horses, uh, reindeers, etc. And for, you can say, unknown reasons, the, the majority of this megafauna, these big-bodied mammals, disappeared presumably around the end of, of the last ice age for most of them. And of course, scientists have been puzzled by what, what really caused this uh, extinction, which was really massive, I mean it's estimated like two-thirds of, of the genera disappeared and uh, over the years people have come up with different theories, some believe it was due to human overkill, uh, it's called the Blitzkrieg hypothesis, I believe it's an expression from Second World War about coming in and taking out the enemy very quickly and, and according to this theory people believe that, that humans spread into those areas, uh, the megaphone had never seen humans before in Europe, Asia and North America and very quickly after first contact, within a thousand years, they have basically killed off most of them. Uh, other people believe that it's impossible to imagine that just a few humans with a fairly simple technology could take out all these mammals. So they have argued that this was due to climatic changes. We know that the climate became warmer and more humid in the end of the last ice <coughs> age. And according to this theory, that caused a change in the vegetation uh, cover and basically a collapse of, of the ecosystem. And then, uh, you can say in more recent years, there has been suggestions of an extraterrestrial impact hitting North, North America 12,900 years, 9, 12, years ago and that accordingly caused a lot of disturbances, wildfires, etc., and basically uh, call, were kind of the driver of, of the extinction. And in order to try to address this, we, we uh, I don't know if it could be charming a bit, but 
uh, we we basically collected uh, uh, you know megafauna uh, you know specimens from across Europe, Asia, and and North America, uh, covering three, uh, six different species: uh, woolly rhinoceros, woolly mammoth, horse, reindeer, bison, and muskox. So basically, representing three that went extinct, and three that somehow if you want uh, survived. And we obtained, we dated, we see 14 dated them. Uh, we uh, uh, we obtained mitochondrial DNA, uh, and then we also coupled uh, th this population genetic analysis with uh, climate niche modeling, where we basically take into account knowledge about how was the climate at different time points, and uh, and and in, in regard to temperature and precipitation. And then based on you know you know that a mammoth was in this place at that time, you can basically try to reconstruct what would have the niche of the mammoth, rhino, etc. have been uh, back in time if it was only driven, if you want, by climate, by, by uh, temperature and the uh, precipitation changes. We also went and revisited the, uh, the archaeological record in detail, trying to figure out, you know, how many specimens have actually been, so to speak, uh, you know, killed and consumed at different time points at different locations. And uh, so this big data set, I mean, to make a, a, a very long story short, I mean, first of all, we could see from the po population genetic analysis uh, coupled with the, with the niche modeling that, that, you know, climate change seems to be a major driver of population fluctuations. However, it's not like, I guess, many people imagine that, you know, all the megafauna species was basically reacting to the climatic changes in the same way. I mean, so when it was cold, it was good to be a muskox, but it's bad to be a bison, for example. So they, you know, when the muskox went up, you know, the bison <laughs> goes down, right, etc. But it seems like all of them really, you can say there's a correlation between changes in effective population size <coughs> and, the, you know, the, the, the niche space, if you want, the climate niche space. Another thing we could see is that for some of these animals, it's pretty hard to imagine that, that humans really are, you can say, a main driver of the extinction because they simply don't overlap with them in time and space. So for example, the musk ox, which was you know, in the past distributed into both uh, you know, Asia and Europe, now it's only found naturally in, in northern Canada and Greenland. But, but it simply doesn't seem to overlap much with humans, you know, and not around the time of extinction in, in Asia and, and, and in Europe. So, I mean, I think this data certainly kind of suggests that climate is really a, a really important, I mean, I don't think we can say it's, it's the driver of the extinction, but it's, we can definitely say it has a huge in, impact on, on, you can say, changes in population size. And we can also say, I think, <coughs> and it's very unlikely that humans, at least in all the cases, is really, uh, you can say, a, a main driver. Another thing which is interesting from the data is that, that you know, it's actually, the, beside we, we are going back in a time frame of 50,000 years, you know, it's actually impossible for us to kind of predict based on the data who would go extinct and who would survive. And this is, of course, something to think about in, in relation to conservation biology, right? Have we been back 20,000 years ago when people had asked me where should we put in our conservation efforts, I would have said, well, let's try to save the reindeer. The musk ox is doing fine, right? And uh, today the reindeer is all over the place and the musk ox uh, kind of bring on, on extinction, right? Uh, well, then we decided to try to investigate. I mean, we know that climate seems to have somehow played a major role, but, but, but how exactly, how do climate influence the the population changes, is it through, you know, vegetation changes as, as has been suggested by peoples? And in order to address this question, we actually took advantage of a discovery with, uh, I did together with a guy called Anders Hansen in, the, in, in my, during my PhD, namely that you can actually retrieve animal and plant DNA directly from sediments, from ancient sediments, even in the absence of macrofossils. So you can actually go out, take a piece of dirt which once was the surface, let's say 20,000 years ago, and then you can extract the DNA from this dirt, and in that DNA you find, you know, a lot of the plant groups that was present at that time, as well as the animals. Also mammoth, bison, also small animals like hare, lemmings, etc. And it not only works on in permafrost regions, it's actually also working outside. So if you go to New Zealand caves, for example, and take sediments, then you can also find, uh, you know, DNA of extinct moa birds. And, and things like that. And uh, what we did was we, 
actually since that uh, we did this paper in 2003, I have you know collected every time I was on expeditions around the world. I brought a freezer with me, a small freezer, and then collected you know permafrost samples uh, across the northern hemisphere. And we we uh, we dated these samples uh, and took use those that are covering the last 50,000 years, which was within you can say right radiocarbon here uh, ages. And then uh, we retrieve first, uh, from, for all of them we retrieve plant DNA, but also from some of them we also uh, retrieve animal DNA, and we also retrieve DNA from uh, nematodes, for example, that can say something about, you know, the humidity of the environment and stuff like that. And uh, uh, this uh, huge data set uh, tells us a number of interesting things, I think. I mean, one is that if you go back, you know, 50,000 years, 40, 50,000 years ago, in these regions, the vegetation cover was very different from the vegetation cover you find in these regions today. And what makes it different is that, first of all, the diversity of plants was much higher. And secondly, you know, the dominant plant, plant type is protein-rich forms. It's not really grasses, <coughs> not according to the DNA. I mean, I know that people doing pollen grains have suggested, you know, it was kind of a grass step, but that's not really what we see. We see, you know, a, a step environment certainly, but dominated by protein-rich forms. And then you get to the last glacial maximum around 20,000 years ago, where you have the coldest and driest stage of the last ice age. And what we see is a drop in the diversity. You don't see that in pollen records, but I think it biologically it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it is an extremely harsh environment. However, it's still at this stage, it's still just, you can say, a subset of the original vegetation that you had before. So it's kind of a subset of that, and it's still dominated by these protein-rich forms. Then when you get to, you can say, the end of the Pleistocene, beginning of the Holocene, and you return, you can say, to a warmer climate again, one would maybe a priori think, well, then you would just return to kind of the same vegetation as you had before, but that's not the case. There you see a complete vegetation turnover. I mean, where you get into a vegetation which is very similar to what you see in those regions today, uh, dominated by grasses uh, and shrubs. Okay, so I guess the first lesson is that, you know, uh, just because you can control or we go back, I mean, control climate doesn't mean necessarily you will return to something you knew before. I mean, there's, beside climate, there's also, you can say, an inherited vegetation history, right, that you have to take into account of how the landscape and and the environment are, are, are shaped. Then what we did was we also, and, and what I could also say is from the nematodes certainly suggest you're going from a very dry, much drier environment to a much wetter environment. And then what we did was we also uh, got access to the stomach content of, uh, uh, you know, all these mummified uh, Ice Age bodies, you know, that has been found, especially in, in Russia. Uh, so we could actually take the stomach content and then look at what is the, uh, you know, food composition, what kind of plants were they actually eating. And what was really striking is that we, we found that in the vast majority of cases, it's completely dominated by these protein-rich forms. So, and therefore, of course, I think it's, it's, it's something really to think about that you, at the time where you probably had the largest extinction of the mammals, that is the time period where you also see the massive decrease in abundance of these protein-rich forms that we know have made up a really important source of, of food for the animals, right? So, I mean, one scenario, there can be many scenarios, I'm sure, very complex with feedbacks, mechanisms, etc. But one simple scenario would, of course, be that you have climate change that is some, together with vegetation history that somehow are driving that change in the vegetation cover, and that change in the vegetation cover is really what causes, you can say, the major collapse mm. of, uh, of the ecosystem. I, knew, I know you can get, probably, you know, you could also, people could argue, well, if the animals goes down in numbers, you know, that might also change the vegetation, etc. But it, nevertheless, I think that's a, a kind of a very simple way to, to look at it. I'll just give you, I, I can't give you so many examples because we, we don't have time, but I just want to give you maybe at least one more, uh, how you can use this uh, sedimentary DNA <laughs> and this is uh, to, to deal with a, a, a question that has been under heavy discussion for a number of years, namely how, you know, how was the, how was the biology, vegetation, you know, in, in Scandinavia 
how did that actually came about? I mean, so you probably know that during the last ice age, Scandinavia was covered by a huge ice cap, right? And the, the general notion has been that all life that existed in Scandinavia actually got extinct, right, during that time. And you can say then it was reintroduced <coughs> when the ice melted away, it was reintroduced from the east and from the south, right, which was ice-free areas. And then there was this uh, Swedish guy, um, uh, Kulman, who was running around in the Swedish mountains and digging stuff up. And there he found, you know, s small pieces of spruce that he then uh, C14 dated and got ages, you know, like 12,000, 14, 16,000, you know. That was basically around the time when all this should have been covered with ice. And he then said, well, I believe that there was refugia in there where, you know, Animal, plants and potentially also animals, but definitely plants could survive and was also part of re, you can say, establishing themselves in Scandinavia after the ice disappeared. And he was literally laughed all the way up to uh, Umeå in northern Sweden. That's a place you don't want to be. And, uh, and uh, you know, and people you know, were accusing him for scientific fraud and, you know, it was really, really nasty. And then, uh, you know, then some geologists uh, started looking into some of these things and they found that there was in fact areas in Scandinavia where there was lake course, for example, going back to during the glaciation, right? I mean, normally you would have, if they had been fully glaciated, there wouldn't have been any, you know, sediments coming in. And suddenly they could see there was sediments coming in and nobody knew exactly how big are those areas, etc. But there was areas uh, both in Sweden and up here in North, uh, uh, in northern Norway did you find these. And then we decided to revisit this whole problem and we decided to do, use both modern genetics and ancient genetics. <laughs> so one thing we did together with Laura Peducci was to basically mitochondrial type, you know, a lot of spruce, both in Norway, Scandinavia, outside Scandinavia. And what was really interesting and striking was that in Scandinavia we found two distinct types, genetic types. And one of them which is the rare one, has so far never been found outside Scandinavia before. And that, of course, could be kind of in agreement with an idea of something very ancient surviving in there, while the other and dominant type you find you know, to the south and you find to, to the east. What we then also did was we went to those areas where the geologists have said you know, there was ice free during a period, took those lake cores, and then looked for spruce DNA in those lake cores. And yes, we actually found, you know, evident, mitochondrial evidence of this very rare, relatively rare spruce in sediment layers which are going back to the time when the rest of Scandinavia was ice covered. So I think that was pretty strong evidence in my mind that Kuhlmann was actually right. I mean, that there was something that survived in there, right? Uh, I know that everybody doesn't agree with me, you know, like two weeks after we published this, there came a reply, but that's not too surprising. That was from those guys that had the other view. Uh, but I think, I mean, you can always, you know, talk about all kinds of issues, but I mean, I think it was pretty striking, and it was also striking because you found evidence of screws not only in one call, right? I mean, you found it from different locations going back to, to, to that time period. Okay, I wanted to, I would have talked about ice, but I will just skip that. Um, yeah. Well, I wonder if I should take this one. Okay, I just want to say very quickly, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, just very quickly, you know, all this um, DNA that that we know is existing in the sediments, right? I mean, the majority, if you go out there, on, uh, you know, the majority of the DNA you will find in soil is actually from dead organisms, right? It's from cells, it's from dead cells. Uh, I mean, the majority of it is microbial, of course, but, but there's also, of course, cells from, uh, from uh, higher organisms. But anyways, it's dead cells and the DNA is fragmented and damaged in various ways, right? It's short fragments, it's cross-links, it's, it's baseless sites, etc. And, and the general notion has been that this DNA is, um, is you know, an energy source for bacteria. The question is, could it actually be used to something else? I mean, could it actually be part of, you can say, natural gene transfer uh, between uh, or, or uh, into bacteria? And um, uh, you, as you know, you know, people already knew at this stage that uh, this type of transfer happens. 
but it has only been shown happening with very, very long stretches of DNA, kilobase stretches of DNA, where you basically have almost two cells very close to each other, I mean, where, you know, they are swapping DNA between each other. Uh, it hasn't been shown naturally with, with very fragmented and damaged DNA. <coughs> There's been some studies where they're kind of with electrical charges and stuff are forcing it into them, but, I mean, that's a different ballgame. And uh, we then looked, one of my PhD students, uh, Søren Overballe, we decided to look whether one of these soil bacteria uh, as a model organism, whether it is in fact possible for them to take up ancient and damaged DNA. And, and first we, first we uh, you know, basically used artificial damaged DNA, right, with, you know, certain size fragments, <coughs> whether it was crosslinks or abasic sites, etc. And we could see this is definitely possible. It happens with a slower rate, lower rate than, uh, uh, than you know, with the long fragments, but it's certainly happening. And it doesn't seem to matter that, you know, that it's damaged and fragmented, etc. And of course, then the, you can say the real test in, in regard to the ancient DNA, uh, whether this could also happen, you know, for, for very ancient DNA, there we basically reconstructed a bacteria where one of these bacteria we modified, so part of its genome was, uh, was similar to a mammoth mitochondrial DNA, a fragment of it. And then we took a mammoth bone and grinded it up, and then we fed it <laughs> to the bacteria, right, and bango, it actually took it up. So what it tells us is that if this, we don't know, of course, how often is this happening in nature? I mean, this is a big question, of course, of the relevance of this, but we, we certainly can say it happens, and it can happen naturally, uh, uh, by natural transformation. But if you imagine, you know, the amount of DNA, also ancient DNA, that are being released to the surroundings all the time, right, from riverbeds, from, you know, around the, the surface of, of the continents, etc. I mean, it's huge amounts. And in principle, in principle at least, you know, you could be in a situation where, and you can say an ancient, um, uh, you know, you can say an ancient skill, so somehow lost, you know, half a million years ago, <coughs> are actually suddenly being reintroduced, right? Which is kind of interesting to think about in terms of evolution, right? Because it would, if it happens to any larger extent, it would kind of change the way, or I mean, at least put an additional new way to how evolution can happen in, in prokaryotes. And, and also, if you look at it practically, uh, you know, for example, at, at hospitals, right, uh, where you are, you know, having problems with antibiotic resistance. And, I mean, antibiotic resistance can, can come from just one or two mutations very close to each other. So if you imagine, you know, when they're just cleaning the surface with alcohol, killing their bacteria, the DNA will still be lying there, right, and become fragmented. And then the next group of bacteria could come in and basically, in principle, take it on. I mean, so, so it's, it's pretty, I think, I mean, it's inter it's, it puts some interesting thoughts into your head. I mean, so it's something we are continuing with. Uh, okay, so to the human stuff. Um, so back in 2010, we sequenced, <coughs> also together with Rasmus, we, we, we did this, uh, the first ancient modern human, you know, the first ancient human genome. And it was from a, a you know, it from, was from a tuft of hair of the oldest, uh, you can say, culture that you find in the Arctic. In, in, it's called the Sakra culture, or here in, in, uh, in America it's called pre-Dorset. And um, so there's all very, very few specimens of humans from, from these Paleo-Eskimos, as they are called, uh, you know, the, the, the cultures that were living in the Arctic prior to Inuits, which are occupying the area today. But there was this tuft of hair, <coughs> and the, the, you know, the DNA was, it was only 4,000 years old, but it was heavily degraded. I mean, the average fragment length was uh, 55 base pairs. Mm -hmm. But we managed uh, sequencing this in 2010 to an average depth of, of 20x coverage, which is pretty good. I mean, it's kind of almost similar to, you know, a pretty reasonable good quality modern human genome. And what we could see with just very simple plots at this time, PCA plots and stuff, was that this individual um, was a male, he's, he's not, I mean, he doesn't seem to be closely related, clo most closely related to present-day Inuit people, nor to, to Native Americans. And there had been, you know, a long discussion of how was the Arctic populated. I mean, some people believe there was only one migration, 
from Siberia going into the Arctic, the ancestors of Inuits, and they went through different cultural transitions, and in the end, becoming uh, getting the so-called Tule culture. Other people believe that there had been multiple migrations coming in from Siberia, and others still believe that there had been Native Americans actually going north and occupying the Arctic, and was then later replaced by Native American ancestors. So. And that kind of got us into this whole, uh, you could say, number of studies on peopling of the Americas, both the people of the Arctic parts of the Americas and also on the lower 48 states. And uh, so the Americas is believed to be, you know, the last continents to be populated by humans, right? And, and therefore, it's also, I think, an interesting model to look at, at, uh, at, you know, past human migrations, because if you can't figure out what happened in the Americas, which is, seems to be a very, fairly simple you know, I don't think there's much hope for the rest of the world I mean, to figure out what's going on there. <coughs> Nevertheless, over the years, uh, people have actually suggested many different models of how this happened. <coughs> I mean, so so the kind of the school book version is that pe pe people came in from, you know, Siberia, right, over the uh, Beringian land bridge. Then they were hanging around in Alaska for, co for some time because there was these two ice caps blocking the way. And when they started melting back, uh, uh, creating an interior ice-free corridor or something around 13,000 years ago, people could then move down south very quickly, you know, move it down, uh, developing the so-called Clovis technology, Clovis <coughs> complex, killing off all the megafauna, and then uh, going down also to uh, South America. Then there's been people arguing in more recent years that there was people actually came into the Americas earlier than that pre clovis so to speak and they probably came along the west coast of uh, of North America because there the, the ice melted back uh, a little bit earlier <coughs> then there's still other people highly estimated archaeologists here <coughs> in the US claiming that uh, the first people coming into Americas actually came from Spain and France and were following you know the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean and kind of hunting seals and stuff, got into the Americas, developed the Clovis culture, and then were later replaced by Native American ancestors coming in. And then there's still other people saying, well, the first humans coming into the Americas are people related to Papuans and are Aborigine Australians getting in somehow and later again being replaced by Native American ancestors. And uh, then, of course, as I told you, with the Arctic, there's also these, uh, all these uh, different models. So for the Arctic, just to stay there, we, we finished, we did a publication last year where we actually had, we had collected almost, I would say, all the human specimens of Paleo-Eskimos that exist. I mean, and that, it's not that many, but we, we had actually been all over the place getting every single one of them. And we also then, of course, we sequenced modern individuals from Siberia, Greenland, Athabascan speaking Native Americans, genome sequence, some of those, et cetera, to kind of figure out how uh, did this happen? And what uh, it became very clear, I think, is that all the Paleo-Eskimos, all those before Tule, the Tule culture, which is only a couple of thousand years old, all those guys are basically the same. I mean, it's the same population. Mm -hmm. So even though you know the archaeologist talks about different cultures, and many of them also talk about different people, then it's the same people. And it seems like they're coming in, uh, you know, independently of Native Americans, independently of Inuit ancestors. They're coming in probably around 5,000 years ago, spreading into uh, Alaska, Canada, and into Greenland. There's periods where they are almost absent from the landscape, and that's probably why people have talked about, you know, extinctions and stuff like that. But, you know, they're almost absent, but they must have continued there. And there is also some archaeological evidence suggesting that then they, in those very harsh times they kind of survived to the south. Uh, and then, you know, there's, then, then they're expanding out again and going through, you know, a pretty severe cultural transition. So it's actually the first example, to my knowledge, where genetics have shown that you can have pretty severe cultural transitions, but where it's done by the same people. And what was also striking is we don't see any, so far we haven't been able to find any evidence of gene flow between these Paleo-Eskimos and Native Americans, although we know they must have met in time and space. But they seem to have been keeping to themselves, so to speak. And then the Thule guys are coming over just not that long ago, a couple of thousand years ago, 
they're staying hanging out here in Alaska, you know, developing a very kind of sophisticated cultural uh, adaptation to, uh, to living in Arctic, uh, uh, marine Arctic environment. And then they're taking off, spreading through the landscape. And basically at the same time as those guys are spreading, all the paddy Eskimo dies. They've survived there for, for almost, uh, almost 5,000 years. And, and, you know, they've just gone bang as these Cthulhu guys cross the landscape. How that happens, we don't know. Is diseases, is whatever, we don't know. But, but uh, they're gone. And even there has been, you know, suggestions that there was remnant populations living somewhere here in Canada until, you know, the, the 1800s and stuff in Eastern Greenland. All those guys, when we tested them, all too many. So the last paddy Eskimos we see 700 years ago, and that's it. Then they are, so far there's no younger evidence. Uh, well, okay, another thing, well, maybe I should, yeah, well, I skipped this with the epigenomics. I don't think we have time. So let's stick to the Americas. Okay, so in terms of the lower 48 states, I mean, there, of course, as you could, I hope, get from my introduction, I mean, Clovis is really a key thing in, in this debate, right? Because all the different theories have a prediction of who should Clovis be. Whether you believe that, that there was people in the Americas before Clovis or not, you know, all of them have a prediction <coughs> who should Clovis be. Should Clovis be, you know, a European? Should Clovis be, you know, somebody related to uh, uh, Papuans and Aborigine Australians? Should Clovis be a Native American? Or should Clovis be some kind of Asian that uh, we don't find in the, in the Americas today, right? And uh, although Clovis technology has been found, you know, all over North America here. There's only one single place where you have found a skeleton associated with Clovis tools. And that's here in Montana. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the strange thing about America, being a European, is that it took me some time to get this, but I mean, if things are found on private land, at least in some states, it's yours, whether it's a piece of gold or it's a skeleton. So this skeleton that was digged out, you know, back in the 60s, had basically been in a bank box on a farm of Monta in, a, in Montana uh, for ever since, and uh, <laughs> together with all the tools. And uh, you know, many people had come and asked, you know, well, couldn't we do DNA on it? And the family had said, no, no, no. And then, luckily, because we had done this uh, paleo Eskimo genome, I sent them that. Uh, paper and then you know the daughter of the guy who found it, she's molecular biologist herself, she's not an ancient DNA researcher but into medical genetics and she said yes okay I'm willing to give it to you so you can do DNA on it if I can participate so you know so I, I said yeah come to Copenhagen and she said well, well what about my child bring the child she said then I can't work well bring the nanny as long as you also bring a piece of bone <laughs> And, and, and so she did. And, uh, it was a, it was a very um, it was a very poor quality. I mean, a lot of for some reason a lot of those skeletons from the lower 48 is, is you can say the DNA preservation is very poor. But nevertheless, we managed actually <laughs> it cost it a lot, but we managed to get a pretty decent genome out of it. I think it was 12 point something x. And uh, what became uh, clear immediately, I would say, is that this individual is a Native American genetically speaking. I mean, the closest living relatives to these individuals are Native Americans. And uh, Rasmus did some, uh, some tests where he looked at, you can say, to what extent this uh, Clovis child, it's a child, and I guess the close up family of this child is directly ancestral uh, to uh, contemporary populations. And, you know, it actually seems like that it's, it's ancestral, that boy and his larger family, if you want, is ancestral to probably most people in, in directly ancestral to most people, Native Americans in South America and Mexico. He's also more closely related to Native American groups up here in Canada than to any other, you can say, old world populations. But it's not, he's not like directly ancestral if you want to them. And the model that seems to be fitting the best the data is one where you can say that you actually have a divergence of, of the northern branch, as we call it here, those Native Americans up here, we don't really know uh, what U.S. looks like, but up here in Canada, and then uh, the South American, Mexican branch, uh, 
you know, that that is actually predating the Anzic child. The Anzic child is 12,600 years old, which potentially would fit with the idea that there potentially could be something pre-Clovis uh, in the Americas. And uh, I, I just want to mention, uh, because I'm here in America, I always mention this actually, but uh, uh, you know, so of course, as you probably know, this is really, this is really, really sensitive stuff to work with in America, you know, genetics on, on the Native Americans, and uh, uh, although we legally, I mean, from a legal perspective, uh, we were actually on uh, completely, on, we were on legal ground, so to speak, because the skeleton was on private land that we had, uh, we had uh, go from the owner, etc., <laughs> and the Bioethical Committee of Denmark, but, but, you know, given that it was a Native American, I, 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 really, I really felt that we needed to somehow engage uh, Native American groups. The, in reality, of course, practically it's impossible to visit all Native American groups in South America and Mexico and ask for permission, right? I mean, that's just not feasible. So instead, we took, I guess, a more pragmatic approach, namely that I said we want to engage and talk before we do any publication or anything. We want to engage and talk to all the groups in Montana, which is uh, 14 tribes. So I went to uh, on a trip uh, to all the for most to most of these reservations, and actually met with uh, the cultural representatives. And I had been warned, very much so, uh, by uh, some of the archaeologists involved in the project, and said this was a very bad idea, and I would probably not survive <laughs> survive that that trip. And I must say, I actually, uh, you know, it was completely opposite. They were very very friendly and very interested also in the research. Uh, however, all of them said that they wanted, uh, now the research was done, they wanted the skeleton reburied. And of course this was, you know, as you probably know, this is the kind of the classical problem, right? I mean, it's one of the, probably one of the most important skeletons in American archaeology. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so, you know, it, the, we were split. I mean, people in the, in the group had different views on this, but my view at least, uh, was that given it's a Native American, I thought they have to, they will have to, it's their decision what they want to do with it. And uh, they wanted to rebury, and I supported the rebury, and the rebury then happened this summer. And it was pretty emotional. I mean, it, uh, there came all, not only all the tribes from Montana, but there was tribes coming from all over the states mm -hmm. participating in this. And, uh, and they were very happy uh, with, with the outcome. Uh, well, the skeleton, of, I'm afraid. I mean, we tried all kinds of solutions with, you know, time capsule and a little piece out there and stuff, but they wanted it all back, and no time capsule. So that's how it went. Anyways, you can say what you do somehow predict, I guess, with, with that study is that there must be, have been people in the Americas before 12,600 years ago, most likely putting it back to pre clovis ages. And we also found evidence of pre clovis occupation in the Paisley Caves in uh, Oregon, <coughs> where, uh, you know, there's these caves, um, and in these caves you find uh, tools and a lot of mammal bones of extinct Pleistocene mammals, but you also literally find hundreds of ancient feces samples. And some of these ancient feces samples goes back to, you know, uh, to before Clovis, to around 1,000 years before Clovis, it means we're back uh, around 14,000. 14,000, a little more than 14,000 years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, Dennis Jenkins, who is the archaeologist there, he <laughs> contacted me and said, well, you know, some of this ancient feces, if you just look at it, it looks pretty human. Could you please find out if, uh, if, if it is a human who put it there? And uh, <laughs> honestly speaking, I didn't find it very interesting because, of, I mean, at that stage I thought, a little, like, if we find out somebody human and made a crab in a cave, <laughs> what, what, what brings us, how, how does that bring us, you know, further? in understanding people of the Americans. But nevertheless, we did it, and there was, in fact, feces samples coming out where the mitochondrial DNA we could get out of it is identical, if you want, with, with haplogroups, mitochondrial haplogroups you find in the Americas today. Mm -hmm. And those samples were dating 14,100 years old. Mm -hmm. And when we did the first paper, that was actually in 2008, I mean, this is probably the paper I've been criticized most of. I mean, we. We were just, I mean, all of 2009, we were dealing with really, really aggressive replies. Mm -hmm. And uh, people had, you know, different, they said, well, I mean, this is impossible. 
uh, they said, why don't you, it's contamination. We had actually typed all the people who had been in there, you know, taking the samples, uh, 48 people, we got hair samples from each of them and typed them and could exclude that was the case. Uh, and, uh, but, and then they said DNA leaching, but I mean, the thing is that, that you know, most of the sediments in these caves are made up of wood rat pellets, of wood rat feces. So we actually also looked for wood rat DNA inside the feces samples, right, and couldn't find any. So I think it's very unlikely that the, the leaching was the thing. And then they had one argument, which I guess you have to be an archaeologist to understand, but nevertheless was very important for them. They said you don't find any tools. Without any tools, you can't say this is a pre clovis site. And I was like, I mean, do you take your knife and a fork with you to a toilet? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they wanted to have uh, tools, and uh, Dennis was digging and digging and digging. And in the end, he actually found, but this was in the Clovis layer, he found uh, two tools, two broken tools. But what was striking here was that those tools were not Clovis tools, although they had Clovis H. They were actually something called Western Stem Point technology, which is quite distinct from uh, Clovis tools. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, of course, with the Clovis first model, you, you predict that everything, both in terms of DNA, but also in terms of tools, should originate from Clovis, right? And suddenly you find a complete different set of tools in the at the same time as Clovis. Mm -hmm. So I would say it doesn't uh, a direct evidence for pre-Clovis occupation, but it certainly suggests that it's more complex than that. And uh, I would say then we put out that paper with the tools and we also read it. We, we're actually into new samplings of copolites, new dating this time with full body suits and everything else and got the same results. So I think, I mean, from my perspective, I, I think it's pretty certain that there was people, you know, at least uh, some thousand years, uh, one or two thousand years before Clovis. Uh, okay, yeah, so Native Americans, uh, according to our results, should then be you can say directly descending from the first peoples in the Americas. But where do Native Americans come from? I mean, we don't find Native Americans today on in the old world, right? Uh, and uh, we got a hint there uh, when we were sequencing the genome of a, a, a skeleton which is 24,000 years old called the Maltar boy from Lake Baikal. So this is on the border between uh, Siberia, Russia, and Mongolia. And the first uh, surprise we got when we sequenced the genome here was that this is not an East Asian. I mean, this is not a, you know, an individual closely related to you know, East Asian people like Japanese, Chinese, etc. This individual is actually seems to be more, much more closely related to peoples in, in northern Scandinavia and maybe also in, in the western part of <coughs> some western parts of Siberia. And to be honest, I thought first I thought this was a contamination. I actually thought, I mean, I put the project on hold for a year because I thought, well, we are just sequencing a contamination. Uh, because it was so, in my mind, it was just so unexpected, I mean, to find something European like that. But then we sequenced more, and then you can start, you know, it's boy, and you can start looking at the contamination levels, and it wasn't very high, you know, at all. Uh, you can use the X chromosome to look at that. And then the next surprise we got was that not only is this boy closely related to present-day European, Northern Europeans and Western nations. It's also very closely related to Native Americans. So you, you had a situation where you had something which was, you can say, if you want partly related to Europeans and partly related to Native Americans, but not much so to East Asians, right? And the, you know, I, I, the general notion has been, you know, that Native Americans is a group of East Asian people crossing the Bering Strait, getting into the Americas, right? And suddenly, it could, we could see this story must be much more complex than that. And in fact, it seems like the living Native Americans today, including the Ansic boy, the Clovis boy, all have around approximately one third of the genome is very closely related to what you see in Maltar. So you can say basically what it suggests is that Native Americans was formed, if you want, by a meeting between at least two peoples, I mean, namely an East Asian branch and then, you know, a, a branch related to Europeans and Western Asian, Western Eurasians. And this kind of mix there may, might have formed uh, Native Americans. And given that the Clovis boy already had that signal, I would say, I mean, it could still happen, of course, in the Americas, pre-Clovis, it's a possibility. We cannot rule out at this moment. But I, I mean, everything being equal, it's probably more likely that it happens somewhere 
in, 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 the, in the old world. And then, you know, they, they uh, kind of uh, <coughs> came into the Americas. Uh, when it comes to early peopling of Europe, we also have done uh, some studies there. And uh, let me just see, how is that? Oh my God. Okay, I'm run we're running out of time here. Okay, uh, sorry. It's, do we want Europe or do we want uh, Australia or the ancient horse? <laughs> 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 so we want, uh, uh, should we take, uh, okay. we can take Europe, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, we sequenced uh, the genome of an uh, individual called Kostinki 14. And Kostinki 14 is one of the oldest anatomically modern humans that you find in, uh, in Europe. It's, uh, it's actually close to, it's closer actually to 37,000 years old. And it's found uh, not that far from Moscow. In, uh, I mean, so it's part of European Russia. And uh, what we could see uh, from this genome is, first of all, and this is important enough, I think, is that it's basically lying, if you want, on the, on the European lineage. Okay, so it's not uh, you know lying on an Asian lineage or related to Africans or something like that. It's actually you could say lying on the European lineage. But what was I guess the biggest surprise with that study was that really that you know all the major genetic components that we find in present-day Europeans, uh, even I mean both on the gatherer components, but also those components that you actually see during the Neolithization. I mean where Europe is transformed from and the gathering to agriculture, uh, and which are coming <coughs> to come from the Middle East, as well as an, a kind of a North Asian influx uh, that people have described. All those different components you actually find in Christianity. So, I mean, while people said previously, you know, that Europe was, there was even a paper out in, in Nature, you know, a few months before this, uh, that said, well, Europe can be described from three migrations. Namely, you know, the first hunter-gatherer migration, and then two migrations that happened after 8,000 years ago. That one with the Neolithic farmers, and then one from Northern Asia coming, coming in. I mean, I think it's, to me at least, the story must be much more complex than that, given that you, 37,000 years ago, basically find all those continents already there in Europe, right? So there's something which I think we don't really understand, and I guess, one of the things here is that, that you know, ancient genomics has been very much on single individuals or just a few individuals, and then based on that data, people have, including myself, I mean, have by, kind of made these you know interpretations, you know, covering half the world, right? Uh, and maybe you know it shows us that that is not that simple. I mean, that you maybe want to have multiple samples, you know, uh, across uh, a time uh, and uh, different areas to really want to figure out what's going on. Okay, I think now I should end because it's uh, it's one o'clock. So yeah, thank you very much for your time.